الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته after the battle of the trench al ahzab and after the prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام went on to fight the tribe of بني قريضة this year is almost to be over the fifth year of Al-Hijrah. And on that particular year, the Prophet ﷺ married Zainab bint Jahsh, his cousin, but also who was married to Zayd ibn Haritha, the so-called adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. And the, this event by itself was a reason a good reason for the hypocrites to talk badly about the Prophet ﷺ. Because in Arabia, the practice was that if you've adopted a son, then he becomes your son. Hence, you cannot marry his daughter because she is your daughter-in-law. This was at the very beginning. And in Islam, as we know from Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah the Almighty tells us that this is not to be practiced anymore and that whoever adopted a son or a daughter, now this adoption has been void and nullified and he is a complete stranger for whom he adopted or his family. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ at the very beginning gave Zainab bin Jahsh his cousin, to his beloved Zayd ibn Haritha, who was his son who, who, uh, uh, by adoption. And she did not want to marry him, actually, because he was a freed slave. He was not an original tribesman like she was, and her lineage is quite high, and she was honorable among her people. Nevertheless, she found no excuse not to obey the Prophet وسلم, and she married him. Their life together was not that smooth. One, one reason or the other, this is marriage. No matter how hard you try and to match make between two people that you think that their marriage would be the best, yet subhanAllah, it never works. And in some cases, a man marries a woman and you say that divorce is inevitable and they go on to live for 50 or 60 years. So all of this is the blessing of Allah Azza wa If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to happen, it happens. In the case of Zainab bin Jahsh and Zayd bin Haritha, it didn't happen. And on and on, Zayd used to go to the Prophet ﷺ complaining from his wife and telling the Prophet ﷺ that he wants to divorce her. They did not know that Allah Azza wa Jal already informed his messenger that Zayd will divorce his wife and you, Muhammad, will marry her. And the Prophet Sallallahu was not easy with this because he was afraid of what the Arabs would say. Yet he knew that this is from Allah. He tried his best. Maybe, subhanAllah, something will change in the future. Maybe Allah Azza wa will, would obrogate this instruction and make their life smooth and, 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 and acceptable. So whenever Zayd came to him, he would calm him and say, go back to your wife, let's hope for the best. And Allah Azza wa Jal blamed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this very surah that you are hiding what Allah will be revealing. And 
this which, means which is that you are hiding that he will divorce Zainab and that you will marry her because Allah revealed that to you before and you are to be blamed for trying not to get this thing done of course the Prophet ﷺ knew it's going to happen but as part of human nature nothing was revealed to him uh, through the Quran so he was anticipating and hoping that Allah Azza wa Jal change this verdict but it, it did not change it came and that is why Aisha may Allah be pleased with her tells us that if the Prophet ﷺ were to hold back anything from the Quran he would have held back this verse where Allah blames him and tells him why are you concealing and holding back some well why are you concealing and not revealing what Allah Azza wa will make as a revelation so the Prophet ﷺ did not hold it back which tells you that this is not from his own making the Quran cannot be from the Prophet ﷺ own making because he cannot be blaming himself and the verses of the Quran came Zayd ibn Haritha divorced his wife Zainab because he could not live with her any longer and after the Idda was over the Prophet ﷺ married Zainab bin Jahsh of course the hypocrites started spreading their rumors and uh, chit-chatting here and there by uh, on, on the topic of the Prophet ﷺ marrying this woman Zainab bin Jahsh and who happened to be the fifth wife of the Prophet ﷺ so that was another cause of uh, uh, disturbance to them and it's uh, a window of opportunity to spread their uh, uh, gossip around Medina they said he married his sister-in-law his uh, daughter-in-law well this is something else but how could he marry the fifth wife while we are only allowed to marry four and of course this is for the Prophet ﷺ only and this was mentioned in the Holy Quran uh, uh, as a permission from Allah to him and again this is an issue that a lot of the uh, Westerners bring up in order to degrade the Prophet ﷺ the Prophet did not marry a second wife until he was approximately 53 years of age so this hints to you and she was over 40 and all the wives he married afterwards they all had something in them for their companions or for their families or because they were the wives or the widowed that is of his beloved companions so he wanted to uh, sympathize with them and give them a home and a shelter and to honor those who died with him in battle also in this year and you know and uh, some points you know I don't know why they didn't uh, like you know mention it or why they didn't speak about it such as the Prophet ﷺ, when he took orders from Allah to marry such uh, Zainab bin Jahsh uh, may Allah be pleased with her or Allah, some of his wives uh, most many of them they were orders from Allah uh, so basically he had to listen to Allah and do it this is number one and number two as well Allah ordered him that he is demanded he is forbidden to marry any more after the Allah revealed in Quran that the wives which the Prophet Sallallahu had he can't take any more he can't even swap any of the Prophet any of the uh, wives which he had with anyone even if he would feel interested in, in a new one so it's like an order to marry and an order as well not to marry anymore so to be fair, when we mention you know this and we say, ah, oh, your prophet did this or did that, maybe it's to be fair to say, yeah, but he got an order not to marry ever. And even us as Muslims, we are we are allowed to marry whenever we want. Just you know, if I have even if I have four wives, I could divorce one and I wait till you know the period time ends, and then I can get a new one. But the Prophet ﷺ, he couldn't. Well, this is something that one should contemplate a little bit more on first of all the Prophet والسلام, it's true that he was instructed to marry but now when you talk to Westerners you don't usually tell them that they would not believe that he is a messenger and that he was ordered to marry because if they be believe that then end of story we have no problem we're talking to people 
that do not accept that the Prophet ﷺ is a messenger. And that is why in so many cases we try to justify his actions and the actions of his companions logically. And if you go to logic, you would find that even if he was not a messenger, and this is very hypothetical because the evidences are overwhelming to the extent that even the non-Muslims themselves, the scholars, admit that he is a prophet, a messenger, and one of the greatest men ever. But hypothetically speaking, we try to justify and to bring his actions to logic with people who do not believe in his message. And that is why we tell them, if you say that the Prophet ﷺ married nine wives, look at the wives he married. You would not find one single virgin except Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her. And the rest are e either widowed once or twice and maybe, maybe thrice. So a person interested in women would not go for other than a virgin. And beside that, look at the age difference and look at the circumstances and look at the benefits out of each and every marriage. Abdullah? Yeah, I once read a report about the, uh, just after the September 11th attacks in New, New York. The firemen on this day, they actually divorced their women and married the, uh, the wives of their colleagues who died. And I thought this is a very strange event because this was like um, a polygamy, polygamous uh, motivation, but they had to leave uh, a, a widow, uh, sorry, they had to leave a mad woman for a widow, which was unfair. Yeah, they felt sympathetic to yeah. the, the widows of their colleagues, but they could not marry more than one at the same time. So they had to, and this is awkward, in order to sympathize with a colleague that died, you divorce your own wife? Destroy two families. This is uh, yeah. un, uh, unimaginable. In Islam, alhamdulillah, we have a legitimate way of acquiring more than one wife. And this brings us to the second uh, point you've uh, raised, and that is, if you have four wives, you have the right to divorce and marry again and divorce and marry again. And this is not the practice of good Muslims. Your divorce, women are not... Uh, uh, dolls to play with in the sense that I don't like her anymore, I divorce her and then I remarry again and, and again and, and again. This is not a practice of a real Muslim. If you marry, then it's for a reason. And if you divorce, definitely it's for a, a, a valid and justifiable reason. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned. Inshallah, we will be back. <laughs> proactive. Dr. Haitham Al-Haddad teaches us how to take a conscious control over our life, set our goals and work to achieve them in Islam. Take firm steps towards your future, be positive and be proactive. Every single Muslim needs to have in order to be an effective person. So proactivity uh, in Islam, how to serve our religion and how to serve uh, our life and our guides through all of this. The proactive person is always motivated. The proactive person always have high ambition. The proactive person, he will not lose his time. He will not waste his time. The proactive person is a generous person. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Also on this year, the fifth year of Hijrah, the verse of hijab was revealed and it became obligatory upon the Muslim women and particularly upon the wives of the Prophet والسلام, to wear the hijab. And Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, the second caliph, was never pleased with the way that the Prophet's wives used to 
come out. And he would always ask the Prophet ﷺ to put the hijab on them. And just for information, what is the meaning of hijab, Abdullah? I believe it's a screen. It's a screen. Linguistically, it means veil. Veil is only for the face. But actually, hijab means something to protect the other party from being seen. So it's like a screen or a visor or a partition. And the origin of this is found in Surah Al-Ahzab. And this is a great surah for Muslims to recite and keep by heart because it has what happened in Al-Khandaq, in the Battle of the Trench. And it has lots of verses that are related to our lives. Among these verses, where Allah Azza wa Jal talks to the Prophet Sallallahu and to his companions. And Allah tells them that if you dine at the Prophet Sallallahu house, do not stay and remain without being permitted to. Once you finish your meal, leave. Because by staying, though you like to stay at the Prophet's house, this harms the Prophet and irritates him. But because he is so kind and merciful, he would not tell you this. So he would just sit with you. And it also tells the companions that whenever you ask the wives of the Prophet for anything, a plate, a fork, anything of the household, you should do this from behind a screen. You should do, the, do this from behind a partition. And why is that? The, Allah says, Almighty, that is for the purification of your hearts, the companions of the Prophet, and for theirs, the wives of the Prophet. ﷺ. So the reason for making hijab obligatory is for the purification of the hearts of the men and women. Now, remember that this has been addressed to the best and the elite of all Muslims at all times, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah is telling us, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, and all the dignitaries of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, whenever you ask your mothers, because the wives of the Prophet ﷺ are considered to be the mothers of the believers. No one can marry them after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. As mentioned in the Holy Quran, it is completely forbidden. So Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, whenever you ask your mothers for something, do not talk to them face to face. There has to be a hijab, a partition, a screen between you and them. And why is that? So that your hearts remain pure and clean, no doubts here or there, and their hearts also remain pure and clean. And one would argue and say, who is in more need of this purification? Us or them? We need it more than them, obviously. Definitely, we need th that purification more than them. So... When you, tell t when you tell someone, do not talk to strange women without protection, in the sense of from behind a veil or in the presence of other people, and do not have a, a normal intermingling with jokes and laughter and socializing, because this is forbidden. One would argue and say, why? We're civilized. We don't have any of these bad thoughts and ideas that you Muslims have, we would say, this is the ruling of Allah. And Allah Azza wa created us, and Allah the Almighty knows exactly what is going to happen to us. And that is why He's instructing us to purify our hearts through talking to strange women from behind a veil, a partition, a screen. And it has nothing to do to, with civilization. On the contrary, if you go to the West, you would find that mixed societies, the rate of adultery or even the rate of incest is so high, it's beyond imagination. I've read once in a, uh, an article in the newspaper, I think it's, it was in the Independent or uh, uh, the Washington Post, 
that they say that during the past three years, the relationship during work has increased up to 60%, in the sense that 60% of workers have relationship with their co-workers. And this is exactly what Islam wants to forbid. The only relationship that is permissible is through the marriage contract. I believe that these uh, uh, relationships, obviously, pe pe people believe that they have control over themselves, which they do have at first. But sometimes, as human beings, not every day is good, and not every morning is good. So from time to time, you may find something in someone which you don't find in your spouse, which leads like a string to, to an affection. And then once the affection is built, then, you know, the rest of it is, is all done with. I, be, I believe this is completely true. And Satan is quite picky. So maybe you would know 100 women at your workplace. Satan chooses the right moment where you're not on good terms with your spouse and then chooses one when it's, the circumstances are, are, are right and ready. She makes and, you laugh. Yes. And, and she, well, he, she well, either she, makes you laugh or you sympathize with her because of a tragedy or a calamity that took place with her. Mm. And it goes on and on. N nevertheless, the ruling of Allah Azza wa Jal was clear. They have to put on the veil and cover themselves completely. Scum, some scholars say that this is only for the wives of the Prophet والسلام, But if you revise the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and if you review the verses of the Quran, you would find that it is for both the wives of the Prophet والسلام, and also for the believers, uh, uh, the women, uh, believing women. So there is no difference in between them. And we are in deep need for such protection for uh, uh, women as mentioned in the Quran. But a, a lot of women don't seem to realize this because although I'm a man myself, a woman, sometimes you can take her how you see her. D nowadays, if a woman is uh, very educated and she has a good position in society, but if she was to dress in, in a miniskirt or very low, revealing clothes, this would be uh, in, the, in the sight of a man it, or the education is gone now. She she becomes like an object because she's she's uh, what you could say advertising herself as not an edu educated woman, but someone who who is available. Because there will be no difference between her and someone who advertises herself on the corner of the street, because this label is the same. Well, this is again, it comes back to realizing what is the word of Allah and what is the the demand of the society. Society nowadays, because they're away from Allah, they demand nudity. And the further you go from the word of Allah, from Islam, the more you come to the savage practice that is practiced in the jungles of Africa. And if you look at those civilized who are far away from Allah and to those savages in Africa, you'd find that they have something a common denominator, and that is nudity. The, while Islam comes to protect people, to have their level of chaste increased by covering them, you can only expose these things to your uh, uh, first uh, grade relatives, brothers, sons, and, 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 and so on, and to your spouse. And no one else is allowed to enjoy uh, females a uh, beauty except these people. Do, is, does this mean that the woman is valuable in Islam then, so it has to be covered and protected from the others? This is an allegation that we claim, but then someone else would come and say, well, if woman is valuable, isn't man also valuable? Why not cover the man himself? So you always talk to the people in the sense that is logical. Yes, women are valuable, but this is not why we uh, uh, cover them. We also value the men and we would like also to protect the men. Actually, the society as a whole is more invaluable than both. And that is why we protect the society. If an individual thinks that intoxicants uh, are okay for him and he could care less about what's going on, 
it is not an excuse for us to permit him to consume intoxicants in his house because he is harming the whole society as a whole. So we would say that women are, inval- are valuable in Islam, but we also do not cover them because of their value. We cover them because of their tremendous effect on men, even if they are exposed, when they are exposed, because men do not have the effect on women that, the, that women have on men. And that is why Islam tells us to separate them for their own good and for the purification of their hearts. And whenever she has to uh, uh, work or, or shop or go out of her house, she has to be properly dressed. Also on that particular year, going back to the seerah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ instructed the killing of a Jew by the name of Abu Rafi' Salam ibn Abi Haqiq. And he was with Bani Quraydha and Bani Nadir aiding the Polythist army to attack the Muslims in uh, uh, the battle of Khandaq, Al-Ahzab. And that's what made the Prophet والسلام, instruct his companions to go and assassinate him. They went in a company of five, by, uh, uh, led by Abdullah ibn Atik, may Allah, or Atik, may Allah be pleased with him. He himself went into his fortress. It was outside of Medina. And he managed to sneak in. The Prophet ﷺ instructed them not to harm any women or children. Only this man who was the enemy of Islam. And alhamdulillah, he managed by the grace of Allah to assassinate him. But while going back, he fell down and broke his leg. His companions carried him to the Prophet ﷺ, who was pleased with what he had done. And... He rubbed his broken uh, leg and subhanallah as a miracle to our Prophet. It was healed on the spot and he walked as if nothing took place. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.